I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit, and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death, but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we truly sit and consider everything that scripture has to offer. We're currently in the part of the book of Deuteronomy that is so extremely easy to skip over. The chapters upon chapters of rules and regulations that don't really seem to apply to modern believers. We aren't likely to go a war against the seven nations that are listed as the ultimate enemy of Hashem in the land of Canaan. We aren't in an agrarian society living close to the land, raising our own crops and herds. In fact, the vast majority of us don't even have gardens. We don't live in a theocracy or even a monarchy. We don't have judges and kings that rule over us as they did for ancient Israel. There's not a tabernacle or a temple that we can go to and offer animal sacrifices as an act of worship. We're so very vastly disconnected from the world that this book was written into. And so when we get to this part of Deuteronomy, it is so easy to skip the 15 or so chapters that are dedicated to instructions for this ancient people. But when we begin to see Deuteronomy as it was intended, we suddenly lose a lot of that hesitation. You see, the pages of Deuteronomy provide for us a template of just how we are to treat the law that is laid out within its pages, a template that is then followed by the prophets, Yeshua, and the apostles, a template of extrapolation of the base principles that underlie these laws to the situations that we face in our own lives, regardless of how distant we are from the original audience of these words. And in this, Deuteronomy reveals that the true exercise of the Torah is in discovering the underlying principles at play in these laws, so that we can then apply them accurately to our own lives. And that's what we've been exploring in the pages of this book. Chapter 5 recounted for us the ten words that were originally given at Sinai. And these ten items, as we have seen, act as an index or a table of contents for the remainder of the commands that are laid out in this book. And as we've gone through these chapters over the last few weeks, we have begun to see this in action. The first word, I am Hashem your God, expanded to a message that takes the form of a proto-gospel. Ideas of faith and grace and justification are all explored in the chapters that expand on this first command. The second command then, expanding in a single chapter that took the direct command about not carving any images and bowing to them, and extrapolating them into commands to actively destroy any such images from your midst, and commands about where and when and how to participate in animal sacrifice so that it's not engaged in a way that would lead to idolatry, things to abstain from that were extremely popular in the day. The third command, do not take the name of Hashem in vain, is extrapolated in the pages of Deuteronomy. It was expanded to contain ideas such as recognizing those in your midst who claim to speak for God or to be part of the community of God, but whose lives do not uphold this claim. And other ideas such as defacing our bodies, eating proper diets, and caring for the vulnerable, especially during times of celebration, they're all part of this ideal. The foundational ideal of each of these found in being a proper image bearer of Hashem to the world at large, in both little and big ways. The fourth command, to keep the Sabbath day, we found that beyond simply one day in seven, this idea is extrapolated into years in the sabbatical year, the year of release from debts and servitude. And this idea is expanded into months in the case of the pilgrimage festivals that Israel was to drop everything in order to participate in. And as we examined each of these commands, we found that the central idea for each of these was the concept of release from a place of oppression. 
a reversal of the natural order of labor and striving to achieve and accomplish. A time when the curse of Adam from the garden is put on hold and we are allowed to live in the way that God intended before the fall. This week we reach the part of Deuteronomy that covers the fifth command. Deuteronomy 5.16 Respect or honor your father and mother, as Hashem your God has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Hashem your God is giving you. Honor your father and mother. A command that on its surface seems to be only concerned with the interaction of family groups. Show honor to your father and your mother, and that is that. What could this command possibly be extrapolated to cover? Well, this week we're going to find that this command has a bit more to it than simply be nice to your parents and show them honor. Rather, when we expand this command, we're going to find that it can be extrapolated to all sorts of human-based authority. Not just how we are to act in respect to our authorities, but also how our authorities are to act towards those that they rule over. The proper exercise of godly authority and living as a person under authority. So with these thoughts in mind, let's turn to Deuteronomy 16 and let's read through the end of chapter 18. Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 18, 22. Appoint judges and officers within all your gates, which Hashem your Elohim is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. Do not distort justice. Do not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Follow righteousness, righteousness alone, so that you live and inherit the land which Hashem your Elohim is giving you. Do not plant for yourself any trees as an asherah near the altar of Hashem your Elohim that you make for yourself. And do not set up a pillar which Hashem your God hates. Do not sacrifice to Hashem your Elohim a bull or sheep which has any blemish or any evil matter, for that is an abomination to Hashem your Elohim. When there is found in your midst in any of your cities which Hashem your Elohim is giving you, a man or a woman who does what is evil in the eyes of Hashem your Elohim in transgressing his covenant, and has gone and served other mighty ones and bowed down to them, or to the sun, or to the moon, or to any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it has been made known to you, and you have heard, and have searched diligently, then see if true, the matter is confirmed that such an abomination has been done in Israel. Then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil matter, and you shall stone to death that man or woman with stones. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is to die be put to death. He is not put to death by the mouth of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and the hand of all the people last. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. When any matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between blood and blood, between plea and plea, or between stroke and stroke, matters of strife within your gates, then you shall rise and go up to the place which Hashem your Elohim chooses, and shall come to the priest, the Levites, and to the judge who is in those days, and shall inquire, and they shall declare to you the word of judgment. And you shall do according to the word which they declare to you from that place which Hashem chooses, and you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. Do according to the Torah in which they teach you, according to the judgment which they say to you. You do not turn to the right or to the left from the word which they declare to you. And the man who acts arrogantly so as not to listen to the priest who stands to serve there before Hashem your Elohim, or to the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel, and let all the people hear and fear and no longer do arrogantly. When you come to the land which Hashem your Elohim is giving you, and shall possess it, and shall dwell in it, and you shall say, Let me set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall certainly set a king over you whom Hashem your Elohim shall choose. Set a king over you from among your brothers. You are not allowed to set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he is not to increase horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to increase horses. For Hashem has said, You do not return that way again. And he is not to increase wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor is he to greatly increase silver and gold for himself. 
and it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah and a book from the one before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, so that he learns to fear Hashem his Elohim, and guard all the words of this Torah and these laws to do them, so that his heart is not lifted up above his brothers, and so as not to turn aside from the command, right or left, so that he prolongs his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. The priests, the Levites, all the tribe of Levi, have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They are to eat the offerings of Hashem made by fire and his inheritance. But among his brothers Levi has no inheritance. Hashem is his inheritance, as he has spoken to him. And this is the priest's right from the people, from those who sacrifice a sacrifice, whether it is a bull or sheep. They shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach, the first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep you give to him. For Hashem your Elohim has chosen him out of all your tribes to stand, to serve in the name of Hashem, him and his sons forever. And when the Levite comes from one of your gates, from where he has sojourned among all Israel, and shall come with all the desire of his being to the place which Hashem chooses, then he shall serve in the name of Hashem his God, like all his brothers, the Levites, who are standing there before Hashem. They are to have portion for portion to eat besides what comes from the sale of his inheritance. When you come into the land which Hashem your Elohim is giving you, you do not learn to do according to the abominations of the nations. Let no one be found among you who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices divination, or a user of magic, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these is an abomination to Hashem, and because of these abominations, Hashem your Elohim drives them out from before you. Be perfect before Hashem your Elohim. For these nations whom you are possessing do listen to those using magic and to diviners. But as for you, Hashem your Elohim has not appointed such for you. Hashem your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brothers. Listen to him. According to all you asked of Hashem, your Elohim in Chorev in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Hashem my Elohim, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And Hashem said to me, What they have spoken is good. I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be the man who does not listen to my words which he speaks in my name, I require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other mighty ones, even that prophet shall die. And when you say in your heart, How do we know the word which Hashem has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of Hashem, and the word is not, or comes not, that is the word which Hashem has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. When we turn to this section of Deuteronomy with the idea that what we are reading is directly related to the fifth command, we kind of expect that this section would cover various ways of reacting to authority. Show them honor, be subject to them, etc. But what do we find when we get here? Rather than the focus being on the people showing honor to those in authority, the overwhelming majority of these chapters is dedicated to describing how to properly exercise authority for those who find themselves in positions of authority. Now, in these chapters, there are four kinds of authority that are explored. There are judges in chapters 16, 18 through 17, 9. There are kings in 17, 14 through 20. Priests and Levites in 18, 1 through 14. And the prophets in 18, 9 through 22. And these types of authority, they cover physical authority in judges and kings, as well as spiritual authority in priests and prophets. So let's go through these and let's see what scripture has to say to each of these positions. Now, first off, the instruction for judges. Now, judges are the first line of interface for the average person with anyone in authority in the ancient Near East. They are the ones who decide disputes between individuals, and they are the ones who are the primary interpreters for applications of the law when issues come up in cases of crime. And these judges are given guidelines by which to exercise authority. Do not distort justice. Do not show partiality. Do not take a bribe. And follow righteousness, righteousness alone. 
These are the guidelines for the judge. And then, as ancient legal codes tend to do, they establish a guideline, and then they follow up with an example. So, imagine that you're in the land, and it comes to your attention that there is a person who is doing evil by transgressing the covenant. Now, this is not just an, oops, I had a bad day, or an evil thought, or I broke one of the commands. This is a matter of idolatry. They've chosen a different god. There is a person who is actively engaged in idolatry or committed one of the items labeled as an abomination. Then this person is subject to capital punishment. This case example provides the lead-in for verses 6 through 7 to then address and give guidelines for how matters of capital punishment are to be handled. This punishment is never to be handed down in a case that has only one witness. There must be two witnesses at a minimum before a case of life and death can be settled. Now, this is an important principle that will come into play later in the book, and it's an important matter throughout the Bible. One witness can make something up, and they may be acting out of a personal vendetta. But with two witnesses, you have a much better chance that the crime was actually committed and that the charges are legitimate. And then comes the matter of the capital punishment itself, and this is an important matter. It is those who witnessed the matter that are to be the first to throw the stones that will eventually cause the death of the offender. And this puts the witnesses in a tight place. If their witness is false, then they are conspiring together to murder an innocent. Not just in principle, they have to get their hands dirty first and take that first step of taking the life. Now, this would hold back many who might otherwise make false statements against another. And so, this will also make a person think twice before witnessing to something that they didn't actually see. In cases of stoning, the entire community was then to participate, but the witnesses were the ones who were doubling down on their testimony by throwing those first stones. So, when Yeshua is asked about stoning the woman caught in adultery, he could in no way condemn her. He didn't witness it. There were no witnesses, and none of the men who were accusing her were willing to take the step of being one to enact the execution. So along with everything else that was going on in that story in John chapter 8, you can add this to the list. Moving on in verse 14, instructions begin that are to govern a king when Israel gets around to demanding a king. Hashem will choose your king for you. You don't get to make that decision. And your king will come from among you. One of your brothers, not a foreigner, a citizen. Now, this is very similar to the rules for who can become a president in the United States. Then come the rules that are to govern the kings of Israel. In the ancient Near East, horses were used for military might. The king is not to seek to increase his military power by accruing a lot of horses. We could say tanks or ships or aircraft. He's not to go to Egypt to gain the means of increasing military power. He is not to marry a lot of women. He is not to seek to become rich off the backs of the people. And he is to write a copy of the Torah for himself and read of it daily. Now, while this seems simple, this isn't easy for a national leader to do, because he must deny himself in every moment and truly become a servant of the people and a servant of God. And he must see himself as a brother of his countrymen, not their better. Because we all want a strong military, right? Who will protect us from the enemies around us? We all want peace with our neighbors, and that is accomplished through intermarriage with the surrounding nations. We all want to live in comfort and have our every need provided for. What are we supposed to do? Trust God to do these things for us? To keep us safe and at peace? To provide for our physical needs? To to provide for our desires and wants? It's so much easier to trust in ourselves and to know where your protection and comfort come from. The king is to embody these ideas of trusting in God by not acting like the world tells them that he should act. The kings of the nations, well, they they gather their might together to provide for the common defense of the people. They make treaties and enter into covenants and bind themselves to royal families of every nation that will have them by marrying their daughters. They live in luxury, surrounded by the finest things in life, and this is just how kings are supposed to act. But what if we take this view and outlook and we apply it to ourselves? I mean, after all, the book that we're discussing, the book of Deuteronomy, it is a suzerain vassal treaty. 
and we are vassals of our king, right? Which means that we're kings. Do we gather might to ourselves for protection? Guns and bows and who knows what else? Do we enter into agreements with our unbelieving neighbors in order to get them to like us? Do we seek after the finer things in life? Now, frankly, it is all too easy to engage in those last two, to enter into a covenant in order to gain wealth or comfort. How many of us have done that in the form of debt? But we are not to engage in these actions. We are to trust God for our peace and our safety. We are to live within our means, and we are not to go to the nations looking to increase our well-being, for they are not the source of our well-being. Hashem is to be our source. And most of all, we are not to be tyrannical to those who are under our care or authority, whether family or employees or patients or anyone else who might fall under your realm of authority. Don't be a tyrant to them. Now all of this combines together to describe what a king should look like, and it looks a lot like what Yeshua states throughout the Gospels, Matthew twenty three eleven through 12 But the greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. It's natural in the heart of men when given a position of honor to seek to increase our own greatness through greed or lust or sheer desire for more power. And Moses addresses each of these impulses in the person who is given the place of greatest honor within the nation of Israel. And Yeshua echoes it. The greatest is to be your servant. He is your brother. Do not raise yourself above that position, even if you are granted a measure of authority. Live your lives in service to all. Leadership is not an excuse to be a tyrant. And it is not a place designed to allow you to simply gratify your every wish, whim, and desire. It is a place of responsibility, a place of service, a place of constant work for the benefit of those who depend on your leadership. And when we examine the kings of Israel, there were many who were terrible, but there was one who was specifically called out in the pages of Scripture as acting contrary to these kingly instructions. 1 Kings chapter 10, 14 through 11, 10 describes the various ways that Solomon, the wisest man in history, broke each of these items one by one. 1 Kings 10, 14, and the weight of the gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. And if you continue on in that chapter, you read of all of the amazing, bountiful things that he accrued to himself. 10, 23, and King Solomon was greater than any of the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. Verse 26, and Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. 10, 28 through 29, and Solomon had horses brought out from Egypt and Kui. The king's merchants brought them in Kui at price. And a chariot came up and went out from Egypt for 600 pieces of silver and a horse 150. And so by their hand, they brought them out to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. And chapter 11, 1 through 3, and King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to the daughter of Pharaoh. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations of who Adonai said to the children of Israel, You do not go into them, and they do not go into you, for they shall certainly turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Solomon, this king who was gifted wisdom above all men, broke each of the commands that were written here in the book of Deuteronomy. And though it's not specifically stated, we can infer that Solomon did not follow the final commands to the kings of Israel, that he did not keep a copy of the Torah with him so that his heart was not lifted up above his brother. Solomon placed himself over his brothers. He wasn't an equal among peers who had a greater responsibility to serve. Rather, he became a king in the image of the nations, lording over his brothers and seeking personal comfort. I mean, after all, he deserved it, right? He was better than them. He was king with more honor. He was wiser. He was smarter. 
he was the high king. And Solomon's pride then caused him to turn aside from the command that Hashem had given, a thing that this Torah was supposed to prevent. 1 Kings 11, 9-10 Therefore Hashem was enraged with Solomon because his heart had turned away from Hashem, God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this word not to go after other gods. But he did not guard what Hashem had commanded. It truly is difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. As we move on then to chapter 18 in Deuteronomy, the text shifts. Up to now, we have seen those who have authority in the physical world. Those who operate in positions of power in the physical lives of their brothers and places of government. But here in chapter 18, the text moves on to those who have authority in the spiritual. To those who speak to Israel on behalf of God and those who act as intermediaries between the layman and their God. And this starts with the priest and the Levite. And the text once again speaks of things that are meant to keep the priest in check, just as the regulations for the king was meant to keep them in check, to remind them of their own office of service. They have no inheritance. Their inheritance is the things that comes from the altar, the portions from the sin and the peace offerings, the first fruits of the field, and even the first fleece from a sheep. And why is this? Because Hashem has chosen them to serve. They're not to have land. They're not to have great wealth. Their role is service to Hashem. And so like a servant, they rely on their master to provide all that they need. And it's all too easy as a person in this position between God and man to forget your place and to assume authority to accumulate wealth and influence, to fall into the same trap of the king and to view themselves as better than their brothers and to lord over those who are under their care. The sons of Eli demonstrate this trap quite effectively in 1 Samuel. But a Levite and a priest do not have authority in the classical sense. They are servants, just as the king is to be a servant. They are peers among brothers, only with a different area of responsibility. Now, from 9 to 14, we're given a list that overlaps some between priests and prophets. And it's a list of things that are not to be done by those who have authority in the spiritual space. Those with authority in the spiritual space are not to engage in the following. Human sacrifice, divination, magic, interpreting of omens, sorcery, necromancy, acting as mediums, or being spiritists. Now, what is it that unifies these types of people together? These are people who seek to use supernatural power. This is their driving force, to exercise power over the elements and over nature, or over other spiritual forces, or over others through supernatural means. And there are many in the church today who have this same motivation. Yeshua has promised that we will do greater things than he did. He gave us authority through his spirit, and so we should have power. And so it is power that is sought after by any means necessary. For some, this means leaving any kind of Messiah-based faith behind and moving on to things like Wicca, New Age, and Satanic practices. And for some, this means combining these practices together to create a syncretistic amalgam religious practice. And then for others, they fall to those who claim Christianity and who operate in power, but who are truly just exercising spiritual power with no concern of its source. This has created movements such as the New Apostolic Reformation Movement, a movement that claims to be operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, but who put experience over scripture, mysticism over doctrine, and modern apostles carry more power than the biblical text. This is a dangerous movement, and it does have power. But the power it has is not found in the Holy Spirit. The power of this movement comes from other sources. They have been duped in their lust for power into accepting whatever they can get their hands on and falling for the first thing to come their way. No discernment, no regard for the source of the power. Simply the thought of, this is power, and I mentally assent to Jesus, and so this must be from him. 
This is not the time for digging into just why this movement is such a danger to believers, but if you would like to learn more, you can simply look up this movement or Google it or YouTube it to gain more information, or I would be happy to share my findings to anyone who might reach out to me seeking more information. The point in this is that we as believers, this shouldn't be our focus. We should not be seeking after power. Power should never be our focus. If we happen to gain power through the Holy Spirit, then it is a responsibility to be used for service and to spread the gospel of this Messiah. It is not an end to be sought out. It is a gift for a faithful servant to use to enhance their reach and ministry. Its sole and only purpose is to demonstrate the character of the God of life. And finally, there are those who are granted a measure of power by God, but who fall into the trap of Solomon and the sons of Eli, believing that power makes them special and better than others. Power from on high will never include an incantation, will never include a spell or a ritual. It will never include speaking to or interacting with the dead or seeking to tell the future through a sign or omen. It will never include speaking a name just right in order to summon the attention of anyone or thing, including Hashem himself. These things, they are not of Hashem. They are evil, and they should not be tolerated in a community, not even in jest. True power will be accompanied by a message of repentance and freedom from bondage that only Yeshua can provide. It will break chains of oppression. It will not be be seeking to impress. It's not a show. It's an act of love. It's an act of service. Moving on, the topic shifts to the office of the prophet, the one who speaks the words of Hashem. Now, it has been a while since I've spoken on this, and so I wanted to reiterate the purpose of a prophet. A prophet is not a teller of the future. They're not simply the godly version of a fortune teller or diviner. A prophet is a person who has been given the responsibility of speaking the words of Hashem, usually to those in power. And a prophet does not say solely what will be. Prophet speaks of what God is doing in the world, past and present. And sometimes that declaration of what God is doing in the world include things that have not yet come to pass. But a future aspect of the message is not absolutely necessary for a person to be a prophet. In verse 18, Deuteronomy speaks of a figure that is a bit shrouded in mystery, at least it was for the people of the time of Deuteronomy. A prophet that will come that will be like Moses. Now, it seems as if everyone has their own take on who this particular prophet is. For Muslims, it is of course Muhammad that is this prophet that's like Moses. Unfortunately, this cannot be the case because the prophecy that is being spoken of here says that this character will come from among your brothers, similar to how a king comes from among your brothers. And Muhammad, he was not a Hebrew. For Jews, this prophet was Joshua. They say that this prophecy isn't so much as telling about something in the far distant future, but rather it's a pointer to the one that would come immediately after Moses. The problem with this view is that Joshua is never once called a prophet anywhere in Scripture. Abraham's called a prophet. Moses is called a prophet. Joshua is not called a prophet. For Christians, this character is none other than Yeshua himself, and this seems to be the best fit for the prophecy, because Yeshua was like Moses in many ways. Let's continue on to the final example of how to recognize a false prophet. Now, we read of one earlier, the prophet with power, but who entices to seek after another god, one who's like Balaam. These prophets are to be removed from the community. Here we read of another kind of false prophet, the prophet that speaks presumptuously, who says, I have a message from the Lord, and then speaks his own words. Or the prophet who speaks in the name of another god. Now, the second one is so similar to the one from Deuteronomy 13 that we're not going to address it today. And so this first type of prophet here, when you aren't sure if a prophet is from God, then how do you test? How do you know? Well, if the prophet claims that a thing is going to come and pass and it doesn't come and pass, then that prophet has spoken presumptuously. 
Now, that seems simple enough. Until you consider Jonah. Jonah, the prophet of Hashem. When he finally got to Nineveh, he spoke a very short message. Forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And forty days later, Nineveh was still there. Nearly a hundred years later, Nineveh was still there as the capital of Assyria as they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and took them into captivity. Was Jonah a false prophet? He said that a thing would come to pass, and it did not come to pass. What are we to do with this? Perhaps we can learn something more from the story of Jonah than what we usually take from it. Jonah was given a message of destruction, sure, but he did not offer a way out. He did not say, unless you repent, even though the story implies that this should have been part of the message. In his desire to see the city of Nineveh destroyed, did he perhaps only give a partial message? A message of destruction without hope. A message without the possibility of repentance and salvation. Was Jonah perhaps given a full gospel message and he only delivered the fire and brimstone part of the message? Well, we don't know for sure because we aren't told, but I find it likely. So was Jonah a false prophet? Well, according to some sects of Judaism and even Christianity, yes, he was. Jonah went into Nineveh as a fortune teller, predicting the future, and that future that he predicted did not happen. So let me ask you another question. Is Jeremiah a false prophet? Because if spotting a false prophet is as simple as, as he said it would happen and it didn't, then perhaps Jeremiah falls in this category as well. Jeremiah twenty-two eighteen through 19 Therefore thus said Hashem concerning Jehoiakim and Yoshiahu, kings of Judah, Let them not lament for him, alas, my brother, or alas, my sister. Let them not lament for him, alas, master, or alas, his excellency. He shall be buried, the burial place of a donkey, dragged and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. This is what Jeremiah states will happen to Jehoiakim. So, let's turn to Second Kings 24 and discover what is recorded about his death, or, more specifically, his burial. Second Kings 24, 5-6 And the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? So yet Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. Now it says Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, not dragged outside the city. Now you might say, but this is just an idiom. He slept with his fathers. Doesn't necessarily denote a burial in a family crypt, but it simply means that he passed into the place of the death of his fathers. I'll give you that. So how about this one? First Samuel twenty three, nine through thirteen. And David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him, and he said to Eviathar the priest, Bring the shoulder garment here. And David said, O Hashem, God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul seeks to come to Keliah to destroy the city for my sake. Are the landowners of Keliah going to surrender me into his hand? Is Saul coming down here as your servant has heard? O Hashem, God of Israel, I pray, let your servant know. And Hashem said, He is coming down. And David said, Are the landowners of Keilah going to surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And Hashem said, They are going to surrender you. Then David and his men and about six hundred arose, and they left Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. And Saul was informed that David had escaped from Keilah, and so he ceased to go out. Now here we have David asking Hashem a question through Eviarthar the priest, uh, presumably using the Urim and the Tumim. In fact, he asks two questions. Is Saul coming to Keilah? Yes. Will the people turn me over? Yes. And so David leaves, and these things that were definitive yes answers do not come to pass. Did Eviathar engage in false prophecy? Or did God lie? Or is there something else going on here? Is recognizing a prophet perhaps a bit more difficult than just waiting to see if what they say will happen happens. I submit that it is. I submit that this instruction is descriptive and not prescriptive, just as with all the others. 
For the majority of those who claim to be prophets and who claim to speak for Hashem and tell the future, we can identify whether or not they are true prophets by simply letting time pass. No, Jesus did not come back in 1988 despite all 88 reasons that were given. False prophecy. No, the world did not end on Yom Teruah 2017. False prophecy. And yet simply because a prophetic statement is made and does not come to pass does not mean that the message was not from God. We have two, possibly three examples from scripture of this very thing occurring with legitimate prophets, and we don't call them false. We understand that there was an understanding in each of these, an unstated unless that was part of these prophecies. These things will come to pass, says the prophet, unless you do something to change the outcome, unless you repent or move or change. So I submit that we should take Yeshua's word on this matter of spotting false prophets. Look to their fruit. Do they exhibit the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Or are they chasing after fame, power, money, women, or to simply be liked? Here is where we will find the false prophets, but again, this takes time. It takes getting to know the prophet and recognizing their motivations, seeing them in stress and at ease, and looking at how they treat both situations. And that brings us to the end of the text for this Parsha. Now, what was it that was missing from this discussion on showing honor to father and mother? Oh, that's right, there is the discussion of how a person should act in response to those who are in authority over them. The fact is that we all find ourselves under various forms of authority, and so Scripture addresses this in many places, one of which is in this Parsha in chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. When you're told to do something by those in authority over you, then do it. Show honor and respect to your human authorities. Okay, how about this? Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let every being be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So he who opposes the authority withstands the institution of God, and those who withstand shall bring judgment on themselves. For those ruling are an object of fear, not to good works, but to evil. Do you wish to not be afraid of the authority? Do good, and you shall have praise from it. For it is a servant of God to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain. For it is a servant of God, a revenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore it is necessary to be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of the conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are servants of God, attending continually to these duties. Render, therefore, to all what is due to them, tax to whom tax is due, toll to whom toll, fear to whom fear, and respect to whom respect. Paul's words here are hard on the Western mind. I, myself, live in a South. It's a place where rebellion against government began twice and was defeated one of those times. We have many philosophers who uphold rebellion against tyranny as the greatest of virtues. There is a bit of rebellion that resides in all of us who walk this walk of Torah. It's human nature to seek to rebel against those who are out to hurt us, to fight back against pain, to fight back against death. But when we look to the positive examples in Scripture, is this what we see them engaging in when it comes to God-appointed authorities of judges and kings? Well, first off, there is David, a man who was being hunted down by the king of Israel. A man who had been appointed by God to rule, wanted him dead. Now, he could have led a rebellion against Saul. He could have killed Saul and taken his place as king twice, but he didn't. Instead, he said this, 1 Samuel 24, 6-7. So he said to his men, Far be it from me by Hashem that I should do this matter to my master, anointed of Hashem, to stretch out my hand against him, for he is the anointed of Hashem. And David dispersed his servants with words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul rose up from the cave and went on his way. Instead of rebellion against the appointed king, 
we find that David restrained his men and continued to live on the run until God took care of Saul his way. Or how about Yeshua, John nineteen ten through 11 Then Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I possess authority to crucify you and I possess authority to release you? And Yeshua answered, You would possess no authority against me if it were not given to you from above. Because of this, he who delivered me to you has a greater sin. Yeshua recognized that the human authorities had the proper power bestowed from God to do what they do. He demonstrated that when it comes to standing up to government, the proper stance is to respectfully decline to participate. He continued to show honor and respect to the authorities, even as they beat him and led him to his death. He demonstrated that when it comes to standing up against a corrupt government, the proper course of action is not to pick up weapons and fight, but rather to submit to the point of death. He lived the maxim of the Psalms. When the wicked sprout like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they could be destroyed forever. He allowed the government to do its worst to him, and then he walked away from it. And this, frankly, this is what so many of us have to look forward to. Allowing those who are in authority over us to do their worst. Taking it all with God's help and walking away in the end, after they have killed our flesh. Because there will come a day, a day when there will be a God-appointed authority over us who will act in the most vile and evil of ways, and yet he's still appointed by God. You see, human governments do belong to Satan. They belong to the enemy. Luke 4, 5-7, through And the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I shall give you, and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. If then you worship before me, all this shall be yours. The kingdoms of the world belong to Satan. They were given delivered to him legitimately. He has been given authority and power over them. It was one of these kingdoms that executed Yeshua, and Yeshua recognized that they had the authority to do so, and it had ultimately been given by God. It is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that stands in opposition to the kingdoms of the world. These same kingdoms that Paul says that we are to be subject to. These same kingdoms that Jeremiah says that we are to pray for. Revelation 13, 4-10 says this, And they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to fight with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great matters and blasphemies. And he was given authority to do so for forty-two months. He opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, to blaspheme his name and his tent and those dwelling in heaven. And it was given to him to fight with the holy ones and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation and all those dwelling on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life of the slain lamb from the foundation of the world shall worship him. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who brings into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword has to be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the holy ones. At this time, when the beast is given authority, what will our role as the kingdom of God be? Do we rebel? Do we fight? Or do we subject ourselves to this authority and say, Do your worst because you can't truly harm me or mine? Do we respect an authority that has gone way outside of its bounds of respectfulness? Honor? Yes. Respect? Yes. Obey? Well, that is a different question entirely. Give honor to whom honor is due. Give respect to whom respect is due. And give obedience and allegiance to the one whom obedience and allegiance is due. And I submit that these are not always the same. Because obedience and allegiance belongs to our king on his throne, no matter who is in authority on the earth, and no matter what nation you live in. Our final authority, even for the governments of the world, is Hashem. 
So even if it means our death and the death of our families and our loved ones and the end of all that is good in our world, we must purpose in ourselves now not to rebel against our authorities. We should honor those in positions of human authority over us, whether they live up to their side of the bargain of being respectable or not. Instead, let's focus on bringing life to our world, building up the good, honest, honorable, and true things of the world, building the kingdom of God, not tearing others down. And in this, we draw closer to the goal of life. So seek life. Dereshchai. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Dereshchai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to seeklifesc.com. That's seeklifesc.com. We'll see you again next time as we Dereshchai, as we seek life. Shalom.